Uh, Dr. Joshua M. Hare is the founding director of the Interdisciplinary Stem Cell Institute at the University of Miami, which houses more than 30 independent research groups devoted to basic scientific and translational work in the field of stem cell therapy and regenerative medicine. He has, uh, is extensively involved in diagnostic gene expression and biomarker studies and in clinical studies of new therapies for heart failure. His topic today, cell therapy for chronic ischemic heart disease from concept to clinic. So please help us welcome to our stage, Dr. Joshua Hare. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's see. Okay. So um, this is a, a very exciting field right now, I think, as everybody recognizes. It's um, the many, many sessions at uh, this meeting and, and at other meetings, big trials underway right now, a lot of enthusiasm. But also importantly, um, two major negative trials, have, at least two that I'm aware of, have been announced at this meeting. So it's a very important time, I think, to reappraise uh, this field as, as it goes forward. And just uh, the way in which I, w I think about this field, and I think it's very important to think through when you're evaluating um, a new trial that's just been announced or uh, under, under consideration, is to think through the uh, patient population, the uh, cell type that's being used, the delivery, and the endpoint selection of the trial. Uh, a misstep or, or a, a miscalculation in either one of these uh, uh, decisions can potentially lead to a negative trial when, the, um, when the, the field actually has promise. So what I'm going to focus on is the work that we've done with chronic heart failure, the first type of patient population, and the uh, phenotypic outcome in that patient population of left ventricular remodeling. It's very important to distinguish chronic heart failure from chronic ischemia or hibernating myocardium, and trials in different areas may respond differently to, uh, to cell therapy. So when we think about uh, remodeling, I think that this is the right way to think about the impact of cell therapy. It's important to distinguish between uh, ischemic injury in its acute phases versus the chronic phases as shown in the, in the lower panel. Uh, treating patients at the time of myocardial infarction uh, has a goal of preventing the remodeling process that can ensue, whereas treating the, uh, the heart failure patient with the chronic healed myocardium is the reversal of remodeling. And I think putting it in that framework helps interpret, tri interpret trials and help, helps design trials. So the uh, three areas that I'd like to cover are our clinical results from, uh, from our group for, for the use of bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells in patients with true ischemic cardiomyopathy. So these are patients who, who do not have hibernating myocardium. It's very important to make that distinction. Some trials use as enrollment criteria the presence of reversible ischemia, which I would characterize as ongoing ischemic heart failure, whereas this is ischemic cardiomyopathy. The, the patients we studied have healed infarcts and do not have evidence of ongoing ischemia. So truly the endpoint is to look at reversal of remodeling and scar size reduction. So um, I'll talk about endpoint selection. I've already laid out the framework that I think remodeling is the, is the important framework to use. And then I'll come back to some of the animal data that we did in parallel to the clinical studies and try to address the question, what's a therapeutic target? And can understanding the therapeutic target help us design improved cell products? I think the, um, the, the, the thinking over the last 10 years needs to be revised somewhat. And th the basic paradigm that the heart uh, has all terminally differentiated myocytes that need to be replaced with a cell product, I think can be, uh, can be looked at with uh, a little bit more granularity and may help us uh, design better, better cell products if we go beyond that basic concept. So th there are a large number of candidates for cell therapy that have been entertained and studied. I won't go through all of them. Autologous whole bone marrow has a very uh, long experience with acute MI studies and with patients with ongoing ischemic heart failure. And uh, there's been a very important development in that field here at this meeting, which I'll come to in the next slide. Uh, mesenchymal stem cells are a very promising cell source. They're widely distributed. They're available in many variations, the prototype being the bone marrow cultured mesenchymal stem cell, which I'll focus on. But there's also the adipose-derived cell 
uh, mesenchymal precursor cells that can be pulled out of the bone marrow based on cell surfaces, cell surface markers like STRO1 and 3, or the uh, procedure of enhancing the mesenchymal stem cells by pre-incubating them with, with a variety of uh, cytokines. Cardiac stem cells have really come into their own in, their last, in the last year with two clinical studies uh, published on C-kit cells and cardiospheres, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. These are the results of the FOCUS CCTRN study that were published yesterday uh, and presented yesterday at late-breaking trials here. And the disappointing uh, conclusion of the study was it was a completely negative study. So with all of the endpoints as shown here, in the interest of time, I won't go through them. The, the article's available uh, on the JAMA web website. But these were patients with chronic active ischemia, heart failure. They received autologous whole bone marrow by intramyocardial injection. And the endpoints uh, did not achieve uh, statistical significance in any of their endpoint. OK, so let's talk about mesenchymal stem cells now, not whole bone marrow. So these are a specific fraction of the bone marrow. As I said, you can also identify them in fat. And they have a lot of advantages that make them an attractive uh, candidate. They're easy to obtain. You expand them in culture. And very importantly, this is the prototypic uh, cell that can be used as an allogeneic graft. So there are trials ongoing now where these cells are administered without Im any immunosuppression. Uh, these cells in well uh, done and robust large animal models have been shown to both prevent and reverse remodeling. So in the acute infarction setting and in the chronic infarct setting, um, the animal data, the preclinical porcine data, strongly supports the use of these cells. Mechanistically, I'll come back to this uh, later, the cells do engraft, they do differentiate, but very importantly, they act beyond just themselves. They interact with host elements, the cardiac stem cells, and that may be the basis for their uh, benefit should they prove to be beneficial. And we have an amassing uh, a, a data set that they are safe in humans. So this is how we purify mesenchymal stem cells from the bone marrow. You can take a bone marrow aspiration, Centrif centrifuge the cells, get a specific cell fraction, they adhere to culture, and then they could be expanded and have been used clinically up through five passages uh, based uh, purely on their ability to adhere to plastic and self-replicate. So uh, we published some data last year, uh, and I'd like to share that data with you. It was a, um, a run-in phase for this 60-patient uh, study, the TACHEFT study, the, uh, the primary ongoing randomized clinical trial has a placebo arm, a mesenchymal stem cell arm, and an autologous whole bone marrow arm. This, um, will be, uh, conclude, this study will conclude enrollment in, in the next few weeks, and hopefully we'll have the results in, the, in a year. But the FDA asked us to do an eight-patient open-label run-in phase in which we were able to get preliminary proof-of-concept data. Um, cells were injected uh, in these patients using the biocardia percutaneous helical system. As you can see, the, si the system has a steerable guide through which a, uh, a catheter can be advanced that has a helical needle. And as shown in the bottom uh, left image, the, there's the needle being engaged in and out of uh, an ex vivo heart. Um, and in the right image is a ventriculogram from, uh, from a patient. And we've had quite a good success result with, uh, with this catheter. It's safe, and we've used it in about 100 patients now. So um, in this eight-patient study, we used cardiac MRI to do very uh, careful phenotyping. And cardiac MRI, shown in these panels, gives you a cine, cine image in the upper uh, left which gives you very precise measures of LV size and function. It can be correlated in the bottom panels with delayed enhancement gadolinium imaging where you can quantify infarct size. And you can use tissue tagging, as shown in the upper right, to um, quantify regional wall motion. Here again is the injection in these uh, patients. We use a, a biplane system, and you can see in this patient which is the same patient from the last image that had the lateral wall infarct, we have injected up and down the lateral wall there. And each of those little white dots represents a site of injection. So the cell, the 200 million cells, are delivered in the border zones of the infarct. And some injections are delivered to the infarct zone itself. And then the patients are followed for a year.
So uh, this is, if you remember one uh, image that I show you uh, today, th this should be it. This is that patient that had the lateral wall infarct. And let me just walk over here. This region is akinetic. At six months, it starts to contract. And by one year, the contraction is, uh, is near normal. And this is a documented myocardial scar. Again, the patient is reperfused and has no active ischemia. So the exciting finding is that there's documented evidence of restoration of function in a patient with a, a chronic healed infarct. And we studied this in eight patients in the study published in Circ Research last year. And in each and every patient, the uh, was restoration of function in the, uh, in the infarcted segments. Does the infarct size reduce? Well, it does, and this is a very important uh, phenotype uh, as discussed by Marban very comprehensively in his Caduceus study. It's very important to document infarct size reduction and restoration of function in the border zones where the infarct is reduced. And we see that very clearly here with bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells. So if you look in these example images at baseline in one year, you could see areas of infarction that are now having uh, restored viability. The viability is measured by the failure to, uh, to uh, retain the gadolinium and restoration of function in that segment, as I'll show you in the next slide. And if you use the gadolinium, you, you can see that we achieve a 20% reduction in scar size, whether looked at at total volume or percentage of the LV. Uh, now, importantly, you can correlate the improvement in function with the restoration in scar size. This is a color coded of the tissue tagging. The conversion from red to green signifies uh, abnormal function becoming normal. And you can see in the bullseye plot, the intensity of the yellow correlates with the scar burden. And you could see function restoring as scar burden is reduced. Very importantly, this leads to infarct uh, to size of the ventricle being reduced, an index of reverse remodeling. You see ED, EDV and ESV going down. And this, importantly, this correlates with restoration of function in those uh, segments in the bottom two panels. So the tissue tagging uh, correlates with the, uh, the size of the uh, scar. OK, so what, what is the phenotype? There's been a lot of discussion in the field that ejection fraction has been used and that there, there have been positive studies published that show small increases in, in ejection fraction. Although these are uh, statistically significant, it's been questioned whether they are medically relevant. So as we thought about this in our, in our group, we really focused on this issue of reversal of remodeling. We feel that we've de demonstrated reversal of remodeling uh, at least in a proof of principle small study. And that's led us to question whether or not ejection fraction perhaps is not the best measurement. Perhaps it's not sensitive enough to detect the physiology that we're interested in. So this is an image from our, uh, our animal model now, the Gottingen mini swine, which has got an infarction. And I think if you just look at the Sine images, it shows the point that I'm trying to make. The shape of the ventricle, as has been well known for several decades now, changes from a, um, a football-shaped structure to a more rounded basketball or soccer ball sh uh, structure. And this can be uh, signified by increases in the ventricle size, both in diastole and systole, and reductions in ejection fraction. But really, it's the change in shape that I think is, is a very important marker. And so we've asked the question whether or not we can use a sphericity index as a marker of response to cell therapy. Uh, and without giving away all of the results, because this will be uh, presented uh, by our team um, uh, tomorrow. This is a poster that will be uh, uh, hung tomorrow morning. We have used a sphericity index that quantifies what portion of, the, um, of a sphere of the left ventricle is filled by the ventricle. And you can see in this one data image that normal sphericity index is about 0.35. This is substantially increased in the patients in this population, consistent with the, not just the enlargement of the ventricle, but the change in shape of the ventricle. And we see very nicely over a 12-month period the restoration of that sphericity index back, back to normal. So perhaps indices like this that actually measure what the phenotype of the response to cell therapy uh, is would be better for uh, planned clinical trials. 
So let, let me come back now to the, uh, the target. What, what, I, what, are, what is cell therapy doing? And I'm going to focus specifically on the ischemic cardiomyopathy patient um, and not necessarily on the other patients. Uh, if we think about the, what I've called the stem cell saga over the last uh, decade or so, it's, it's very interesting in its translational perspective, but it's also taught us a, trend, a tremendous amount about what the, um, the therapeutic target of cell therapy could be. And very briefly, we've used a lot of bone marrow uh, uh, studies, both experimentally and clinically, and these have given us mixed results. What's very exciting and new are studies that look at cardiac stem cells, studies that show that the heart has compartments of stem cells, that these stem cells can be extracted and purified and perhaps used as a therapeutic. And then I've told you about what we've done with mesenchymal stem cells, both in animal models and in proof of concept clinical trials. So is there an interaction between these cells? And, and indeed there is, and uh, we propose a hypothesis that it might be the cell-cell interactions that are the, uh, the heart of the matter, if you will, and not necessarily a single cell type trying to reproduce a missing cell. We know that there are um, uh, so-called cardiac stem cell niches in the heart that are akin to the niches, the, the hematopoietic stem cell niches, and the niches in hair follicles and our gut. And indeed, these niches are present in the heart. More importantly, the niches are made up not just of the cardiac stem cells, but also um, uh, regulatory elements and, and structural cells. And it could be, as I, I, according to our hypothesis, that the mesenchymal stem cells interact with the cardiac stem cells and reconstitute niches. And that may be the basis for, uh, by which the therapeutic effect occurs. Um, the uh, Scipio study was published last November, and this was a landmark study, the first use of cardiac stem cells, autologous cardiac stem cells as a uh, as cell product. And here's um, a slide from Piero Inversa and Roberto Boli showing the most dramatic reported increases in ejection fraction in a study of patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, about an eight EF unit increase at, uh, at four months progressing to a 12-month increase at uh, 12 months. This was a small study, uh, also an, uh, an early phase study, but it does raise the question that the CKIT cells could be very, very effective. Uh, let me show you some data from our porcine model. This is the infarct size reduction in a chronic ischemic uh, porcine model. Uh, we see limited engraftment of mesenchymal stem cells. Now I've gone back to mesenchymal stem cells. There's some cardiomyocyte differentiation. There's blood vessel differentiation, and there's also reservoirs of cells that are retained in the heart. And in this image, we're using the Y chromosome to track the cells. But we did this study as well, and uh, this was um, a very exciting finding published a couple of years ago, where we asked the question, do the mesenchymal stem cells trigger a proliferation or recruitment of the endogenous C-kit cells? And indeed they do. In the left panel, the red cells are the C-kit cells, the endogenous porcine cells, the green cells are the cells we've injected. And in this uh, very pretty image, you see that there is actually a potential cell-cell connection between the uh, green cell and the red cell, the MSC and the CKIT cell, median mediated by connexin 43. If we quantify the number of CKIT cells in the MSC injected animals, they're dramatically uh, increased in the left panel in the, in the ischemic zone, border zone, and non-ischemic zone. And also the lineage commitment of the CKIT cells, as shown in this panel, is enhanced by mesenchymal stem cell injection. So there appears to be an interaction between the bone marrow MSCs that we've injected and the endogenous CKIT cells which have been shown by Inversa and Boley to be highly therapeutic if extracted from the body and redeployed. So perhaps this is a way to enhance the C-kit cell function by using mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, here's another uh, image of what could be construed to be a niche, a cluster of cells made up of the C-kit and uh, the GFP cells with uh, abundant connexin 43. And in other images, we show that the cells are also connected by n adherin um, in order to have a regenerative effect, you must uh, see evidence of cell mitosis, potentially transient amplifying cells, and in this porcine study, we showed abundant evidence of cardiomyocytes in mitosis going through, uh, as, as marked by phospho-H3. 
I'll just skip over that. Now, which cell is more important? Um, it's probably the C kit cell. This is a study where we compared uh, C kit cell injection versus MSC injection in a murine model. And I think you can see that each white dot is the quantification of a cell. The C kit cells have a greater propensity to engraft, differentiate, and repair the heart. But we're intrigued by the idea that the mixture may enhance the cell therapeutic and may go beyond uh, what either cell can do alone. In the upper panel, you see what happens in culture if you mix mesenchymal stem cells with C kit cells. The, uh, the green bar is the abundance of C kit cells in culture when plated, when co-cultured with mesenchymal stem cells. And the bottom two panels show the lineage commitment of those C kit cells towards a myocyte a lineage as measured by NKX 2.5 in the, in the bottom right panel. So the NKX 2.5 positivity of the cells go, goes way up when interacted with, um, with mesenchymal stem cells. So to test that proof of principle, we, uh, we, we did the obvious experiment. We injected in, the, in a porcine model each cell alone and the mixture. And uh, uh, to our delight, we found that indeed the infarct size reduction is about twofold greater with the mixture than with either cell alone. Importantly, each cell alone does have an effect. It reduces infarct size by about 10% at four weeks, but it's double at 20% at four weeks with the mixture. We do pressure volume loop analysis. We see a very nice effect on diastolic function of the ventricle. It's near normalized by the injection of the cell mixture. And if we look at cell engraftment, it's sevenfold higher with the mixture than with either cell alone, as shown here. Um, also, if we look at the, uh, the cells in mitosis, again, the end product of what you would expect to have if you're going to have myocyte regeneration. Here, too, we see a dramatic increase in mitotic uh, cells with the combination injection versus either cell alone. So it really appears that the mixture has uh, a synergistic effect to re reduce infarct size, improve function of the ventricle, and create regenerative, uh, uh, the appearance of regenerating myocytes. We uh, are very pleased that we're going to reduce this to a, a clinical trial and now test this in people in the AIRMID study, uh, which stands for autologous cardioblasts for re reverse remodeling and idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. We're going to do this trial as part of the NHLBI uh, network, the new iteration of the network. So um, finally, I've covered a lot of material, but I've hoped, I hope I've given you a, um, a uh, framework in which to interpret the field. I think we can say after uh, a very robust uh, t decade long of, uh, of work that cell therapy for heart failure is safe and feasible. Cells can be injected by catheters. You don't need surgery. There's an amassing data support for the role of both mesenchymal type cells and cardiac stem cells for myocardial regeneration and reversal of remodeling. The quest for sensitive outcome indices is still ongoing, and I think this is very important in future trials. We're spending a lot of resources on these trials, and we want to make sure we have the right endpoints as we go forward. I think we should think more about the mechanisms in a multifactorial way and get away from the notion that we're simply replacing something that's been lost. Perhaps we're doing something much more by creating a milieu for regeneration. And uh, finally, I our data support the, the fact that mesenchymal stem cells enhance C-kit engraftment and lineage commitment. And I think that we should think about a uh, stem cell or regenerative niche as a therapeutic target. And again, not just cell replacement one for one. So I'll end by thanking uh, my uh, terrific team at uh, the University of Miami. We have two teams. A lot of the folks are here. Uh, the basic uh, science team in the top panel and the clinical trial team in the bottom panel. And finally, uh, a wonderful group of patients who participated in our investigator-initiated studies at the uh, University of Miami. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, if I have time, I'll be more than happy to answer some questions. Yes, I think we do have a, yeah, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hare. We do have time for maybe a couple of questions here before we have to move on to our next speaker right here. <coughs> Can you comment on the arrhythmia risk based on the uh, expression of Conexin 43? Yes. So 
Interestingly, you know, there's a big concern about proarrhythmia that came out of the skeletal myoblast trials, and we've been very attuned to this. In our first study of mesenchymal stem cells in post-infarction patients, we saw a dramatic reduction of, uh, of, of ventricular arrhythmic events. And I would hypothesize that the connexin 43 gap junctions between MSCs and host myocardium were actually antiarrhythmic. We're very carefully monitoring all of the patients in our ongoing studies and hope to have more data on that in the future. Josh, it was a wonderful talk. Um, can you just uh, have some commentary on autologous versus allogeneic as a source, older people, heart failure, et cetera? What do you think we're going? Great, uh, great question, Les. Thank you. We're actually doing a study called the Poseidon study. It's a, it's a concluded enrollment. We are at six months follow-up. I'm hoping I can present, so six months from now, I'm hoping I can announce the results. Head-to-head -head randomized comparison of auto versus allo to uh, it, it exactly address that issue. You can imagine um, benefits and disadvantages from either approach. The most obvious advantage of allogeneic is that it, you're now dealing with an off-the-shelf product that's ready to go in any given patient. But the, we'll, we'll have the data in about six months. Fantastic. How about another thank you for Dr. Hare?